Hello and welcome to Live Healthy, Live Well, West Virginia. I'm your host, Dr. Lisa Costello, a pediatric hospitalist and assistant professor of pediatrics at the West Virginia University School of Medicine. My guest today is Nicole Surgent. Nicole is a physical therapist, co-owner of Milestones and Miracles LLC, and co-creator of 123 Just Play With Me. Nicole practices in early intervention and promotes play. She's joining us today to discuss the importance of early intervention and play. Welcome to the show, Nicole. Hello, thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Well, we are so happy to have you and so happy to talk about play. Um, many of our viewers know I have an almost two-year-old, so um, the topic of today's show is certainly something that has been important in my life as a mom. And I think whether you have children of your own or friends or grandchildren or cousins or what have you, this is a really important topic. So thanks for joining us. Certainly. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about what you do as a physical therapist. We have different health professionals on. We've yet to have a physical therapist. So talk to us a little bit about what you do in your job as a physical therapist. Sure. So uh, I like to say that physical therapists are science, scientists of movement. So we are experts in the movement of the body. We help people get where they want to go. And that's a broad explanation. Um, physical therapy certainly reaches lots of different populations and lots of different settings across the lifespan. But my particular area of practice is in early intervention. So my oldest patients are three years old. I see them from infancy, just a few days old, through age three. Um, I practice in early intervention and I do in-home visits through our state's early intervention program. So on a practical basis, my days are spent driving around, um, mostly Berkeley and Jefferson counties in the Eastern Panhandle. And I meet with families that um, whose children have become eligible and enrolled in our program. And um, I work with them to help them teach their children how to move and learn through exploring. That's wonderful and such an important program that we're going to dive a little bit more into. So before we talk about early intervention, I think it's important that maybe we set the stage just talking a little bit about child development and, and how much movement is important of part of that. And so um, what's important for parents and caregivers to know when it comes um, to child development? I think when you have a child or if you've ever gone to a healthcare visit with a, a child, there's a lot of questions about development. And so share with our viewers a little bit about how that it impacts what you do in regards to uh, a child's development. Sure. I think the first thing to note is just how rapid it is in the first three years. Um, it's one of the most rapid, if not the most rapid, changes in the body through the lifespan. When you think about an infant, even to a two-year-old, how different they are and how quickly those changes happen. It's also important to note how it, it's all really tied together. You know, their ability to move and explore is really tied closely to their ability to learn, so cognitive development to interact socially and with communication um, and just to kind of all those areas of learning are tied together um, with their movement patterns so you know in my job as a physical therapist, I work on movement, but in early intervention, our lanes kind of blur a lot because we have to know about general development in the cognitive areas and language and social and fine motor because children are just really in those early ages exploring their environment with all their senses and in a variety of ways. Um, and it's so tied together that there's no way just to simply tease out movement. Um, it's exciting, I think. I think it's just fascinating um, how our nervous systems are wired for an infant to, for their body to naturally know and, and um, and explore and do what comes next and how closely those things are tied together at each stage. Um, so once you learn a little bit about what to expect and how to encourage it, or at least how to notice it, it can, even the small mini milestones I find can be pretty fascinating. Absolutely. And 
as I already shared, I have an almost two year old and it is um, even if I've gone away for a weekend for a conference, I come home and I'm amazed at the new things that she's picked up. And so it really is such a, a rapid time. So you've mentioned and we've already shared that you work in early intervention. Talk to us a little bit about more about what that means and and what kind of the field and the, the early intervention looks like. So in the United States, we have something wonderful called the Individuals, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and that protects all individuals with disabilities um, across the lifespan. And so for infants and toddlers, we are we fall under part C of that plan, and that's called the early intervention realm. Every state offers and is required to offer early intervention services. How they decide to um, provide those services to their citizens varies state to state. In West Virginia, our program is called West Virginia Birth to Three. Um, we are under the hub of the Department of Health and Human Resources. So I like to think of us, you know, we're, we are medical, uh, especially as therapists, but we are under the educational umbrella. Um, so children from birth to three who have established diagnoses that we know will present challenges to their development through the lifespan, are eligible for our services, but we also service children who don't have diagnoses that just have delays in a few areas of development. Also, we serve children who don't have delays, but have substantial risks for delay based on medical or social factors. So our reach of who we serve is um, pretty broad. Um, in 2022, we served almost 8,000 infants across our state. And under our services, we have um, physical, speech, and occupational therapy. We have um, dietitians, nursing, social work. Um, we have service coordination, individuals that help uh, organize our teams and tie families to resources. I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting any psychology. Um, we have a variety of services. In West Virginia, if a child qualifies for our program, those services are completely free We do, to the family. Um, we do not bill insurance for our services. The state provides those services to families. Um, and which I think is great because it doesn't limit access to those children. And we know early access is so crucial. The services are provided in home um, because research shows us that the natural environment is the best place for infants to learn, um, to be comfortable and to develop naturally. And we provide services through a coaching model. So as opposed to direct intervention that you might receive from a physical therapist in a clinic, I work very close with parents and caretakers um, to model and suggest strategies that they can do when I'm not there um, so that all those hours of the day are therapeutic for that child. And the, pa the parent or the caregiver becomes empowered to understand how to promote development in natural settings, in daily routines. And then also um, I can serve um, as a sounding board to answer questions and qu sort of guide medical care as well. I think that's so wonderful as a pediatrician and I care for children mostly when they're in the hospital. We frequently will refer to birth to three, which is um, in our state. But as you mentioned, every state um, has to offer these services and in different states it might be referred to as something differently and I thought you gave some great statistics about um, you know who is served by um, the West Virginia birth of three program 8,000 um, families and, and children and that's wonderful and as you said it's mostly on the road as you were saying that you do about driving around and um, it's such mm -hmm. an incredible service that is offered and so talk to us a little bit about why this early intervention matters you already talked about how this time frame in a person's life is so rapidly changing and talk to us a little bit about why intervening early is so crucial for long-term success? 
Great. Well, as you know, as a pediatrician, the the young brain, the the brain of an infant and a toddler is still very plastic, meaning that it's not hardwired, it's changeable based on what it's exposed to. So the experiences, uh, the influences, the everything that came to us as infants and toddlers helps to hardwire our brains um, for our circuitry for life. So, you know, those setting up the environment to be nurturing and stimulating um, and, and the importance of play early on really provides crucial connections that serve us throughout our our life. And we know that that brain development is extremely rapid in the first five years, but especially in the first three years. That's the highest level of um, rewiring and moldability of the brain per se. And so, um, if we get those services in sooner for children who we know will be delayed or who are at risk for delayed or who, or who are experiencing delays, we know that our ability to make an impact and create lasting change is higher if we do it sooner rather than later. So that's why that early part of early intervention is so important and so essential. And I think um, it's important to, even if you're, a parent or a caregiver, you know, talk it over with your pediatrician or your healthcare provider. Um, you can also, I think, call um, or find more information out on like the Birth to Three website or whatever early intervention program is in your state um, to right. kind of seek out those services um, and and try to figure out, you know, is my child eligible? Um, so how would someone oh, find out I think if? It's mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to note that for West Virginia birth to three, you don't need a physician's referral. Anyone can refer their own child for evaluation. So if you have concerns about how your child or a child in your life is moving, talking, exploring, their social emotional state, their adaptive skills with eating, um, sleeping, anything like that, you can refer yourself. Um, and you're entitled to an evaluation for that referral. Um, the specialists who come in and evaluate your child during the eligibility and assessment process will let you know if there's delays. And we do evaluate children that aren't delayed or do not meet the criteria for eligibility for our program, but I always think there's something to be gained from that evaluation process from an educational standpoint. So my advice is when in doubt, refer yourself don't wait um, and don't think that you have to have someone else refer you. I think that's great advice because really I was going to ask you, you know, when should someone reach out? And I think you just phrased it very well. You know, if you have a child in your life, um, they can seek those services out themselves. And I think that's a great benefit of the early intervention program here in our state. Um, and again, depending upon where you live, you would want to find what um, early intervention program exists in your state. I think it's so great that you can call yourself and kind of get that referral. And I have encountered that. I've seen patients come to the hospital and I'll ask, you know, because maybe I've picked up and I'll say, you know, have you been in birth to three? And they'll say, oh yeah, like I called and got an evaluation. So that can really be a way, as you were talking about empowering the parent or caregiver to, you know, take that step. If they do have a concern or question, they can seek that out. Yep. So is really, where's the best way for a parent or caregiver to, to find out um, how mm -hmm. to get access to these services? So our state is divided into eight regional administrative units. And if you go to DHHR's website, um, there is a link for birth to three. You can then see for your county which region you're in. And there's a phone, there's a map that has a phone number for each region. So you can just call and make the referral. Um, I will also say not to toot our own horn, um, but I've been working with West Virginia Birth to Three since 2001, and perpetually our program has ranked in the top five for outcomes um, for services delivered in the nation. So, you know, we know as being longtime West Virginians that there are a lot of things that our state struggles with, but 
Birth to Three has always been a shining example of some place where we've invested our resources and had really great outcomes as a result of that investment. So I'm very proud of our program and how responsive we are to families and the differences that we can make um, in those families. Our relationships are very deep. You know, you can imagine going to somebody's house every week for three years. By the time we're finished, we know the grandparents and the dog and the neighbors. Um, and those relationships from a community basis are ones that we keep and maintain for a very long time after our children age out. So um, it is a high quality program in West Virginia and definitely worth people's um, time to consider if they have concerns. Yeah, it is so great. It's such a great program. And um, we've been showing the, the website. Um, and so you could always turn to your favorite search engine and, and search that way as well. And whatever state you live in, you could find um, the early intervention program in your state. Well, Nicole, now I want to kind of shift a little bit for the rest of the time we have together um, because early intervention is really important, like you talked about, for perhaps mm -hmm. people who, you know, their their child, whether it's their family member or their healthcare provider has uh, identified that they're at risk or they are having some delays or um, are at risk for them. However, I want to talk now about the power of play. And I know that you're a big advocate for promoting play because play is so um, important in what children do. And so you actually um, created um, a product that as a new mom, I can say I have used. Um, so why don't you talk to us a little bit about the importance of play and um, the family business that you own, um, Milestones and Miracles and um, One, Two, Three, Just Play With Me. So um, my best friend, who's a speech language pathologist who also works for West Virginia Birth to Three, her name is Lacey Marisi. We started having children of our own around the same time. And we were noticing within our friend group that our friends had a lot of questions about development. You know, they were going to their pediatrician's visits and they had great pediatricians, but as we know, time is limited in that office. And they often wondered, you know, is my child walking on time? Are they saying enough words? And what we realized as moms were that there were reference books that talked about when a child should do things. Um, and there were some that talked about play ideas. But in early intervention, we say, you know, the next milestone we're working on is this. And these are some natural play ideas you can do to achieve that milestone. And we started to notice a big gap between what is expected and what is available for parents. And we noticed ourselves that there was a lot of stress on young families um, with the expectation that children should do things before they're developmentally ready. Um, you know, there's a lot of products and there's a lot of information trying to teach your child to read early or count their ABCs. And the research shows us that typical developmental play, especially outside, plays a much stronger role in brain development and as a solid basis for learning than any sort of early, early academics for children. Um, and so we wanted to be a voice for parents like ourselves to reassure that traditional play is the best choice and to promote it. Um, so we form Milestones and Miracles. It's our own small business and um, we have talked and talked about play um, everywhere from church basements in small towns and daycare centers to the national speech and language hearings, um, their national conference. We are providers of continuing education through MedBridge Education. It's an online platform that offers um, CEUs for therapists. We will talk to anyone who will listen to us about how play is at risk for children and how important it is to promote. And one group that we've really also spent time educating and talking to is educators. Um, and we've tried to spend time talking to people who make educational decisions because what we're seeing um, historically is that the amount of time a young child has for natural, outdoor, unstructured play has really decreased through the years. And there's a lot of negative side effects because of that, um, physically, but also from a mental health perspective. And of all the things Lacey and I talk about, that's probably the one that is hits most for us and we feel like is most important in the preservation of play. Um, because we want children to be healthy and happy. So 
we've done that in a variety of ways. Um, we do have a podcast um, with some episodes. It's called More Than Child's Play that we've had specialists come in and talk to us about that. But really, we we just want to communicate to families that play is important. Um, so yes, we created a product called One Two Three Just Play with Me, and we do. Um, sell it on our website and on Amazon. And it sort of gives a more detailed look. Uh, I have one I can show you. It comes uh, now in a card set with a ring. It used to be in a box, but those cards got lost and or out of order. So we decided to ring them. But it has different cards for the different domains of child development. And on the front of those cards, it has specific milestones that on the back we pair with uh, developmental play or intervention suggestions. And so um, we sell it a lot to young families or as gifts for new babies, but also to pediatric professionals who are using it as a resource in their field. Yeah, I can attest as a mother of an almost two-year-old, um, it's been helpful. And uh, again, like you said, depending upon how old the child is, there are certain things that given their age, they should be more likely or expected to engage with play. So um, why is that important for parents to, you know, have children engage in that age specific play? Or maybe give us an example of what would be, you know, an age uh, appropriate play for a, a certain age child? So one of the things that I love is, you know, around six months, kids start to imitate. That's an example. Like you stick out your tongue, they stick out your tongue. You blow raspberries with your lips, they'll blow raspberries. Or you bang on the table, they'll bang on their high chair tray. Um, and, you know, at that time, you really also start to see babbling. I say baba, you say baba. But before you can do anything, you have to learn how to imitate. If you think of everything you've ever learned in your life, whether it's turning a cartwheel or doing an algebra pro problem or shooting a basket, Lisa, in basketball, everything you've learned is by imitation. Someone showed you how to do that. And so, you know, simple, it seems simple, but really um, important uh, foundational skills like imitation happen around six months. So if a child isn't imitating in the six, seven month range, it's also important for families to realize so that they can encourage it in specific ways and see if they can get a child to imitate. Because we know if we cannot get a child to imitate, then some of their other learning skills that happen after might be hard for them. So, you know, taking the time to notice those mini milestones, um, one, it's just fun to appreciate them, I think, but also to understand how they're foundational to everything that happens above is helpful. Yeah, I think that's really good. And then what we were talking about before with early intervention through play, if you're noticing perhaps your child and that's where um, having kind of a prompt to, to know, hey, what should my child be doing at this particular age? If they're not doing that, um, that's when they might need to kind of reach out to birth to three or talk to their healthcare provider um, to see if that's something that, you know, might need a little bit more looking into. How long um, or how much play should a child get in, say, a day or even a week? If they're not sleeping or eating, they should be playing. <laughs> um, you know, play shouldn't be structured, okay, from 10 to 1130, we're going to play. Their job is to play. Um, so that's what they should be doing all of the time, unless they are sleeping or, um, you know, even in the car, they can be playing with a toy in the car, even sitting in the doctor's office. There's ways to play peekaboo or play, you know, children are naturally playing. Mammals are naturally playing. Animals even do this. So they should be playing all the time. I will tell you um, one thing, and I, and I know that you agree with this, that gets in the way of natural play is our access to screens. And, you know, I used to say when I was little, and I'm, I'm dating myself, um, T the kids shows were only on at a certain time of the day or a certain time of the week. And that was it. You know, <laughs> either you saw them or you didn't see them. Now there's a show available on every device around them. The buffet is always open and there's a million choices, right? And um, it can be quite addicting, um, you know, and it keeps them quiet. And so with busy families, and I understand that as a mom, when you're just trying to work or get things done, they're happy and they're settled sometimes when they're viewing a screen. 
Um, we know that young children, as young as three to four years old, are spending at close to seven hours a day on mm -hmm. a screen. Um, and there's a lot of detrimental effects to that. One is a link to um, ADHD rates, that there's been a lot of study on that out of Seattle Children's. Um, with Dr. Christakis. And also the bigger thing is what are they not doing when they're on the screen? You know, they're not running, they're not jumping, they're not looking at a book, they're not figuring out a puzzle, they're not playing dolls, they're not playing pretend with their friends and practicing roles and acting things out. All of those things prepare you for adulthood. You know, we joke that you didn't grow up one day and just know how to have a constructive conversation over a disagreement with your spouse or your coworker. you gained those skills while you were playing kickball in the backyard and you had to negotiate with your neighbor on a certain play and if it was in or if it was out and so when children are spending time all that time just looking at a screen and not doing those typical childhood interactive things, we see that later on in life they're having challenges physically um, with obesity rates and cardiovascular health, emotionally, um, socially with interactions with others, and also from a sensory perspective for regulation of sleep and being able to attend um, that can be a big challenge. I could talk about this forever, but one example is a playground. You know, when I was a little kid, there was a, a merry-go-round and a teeter-totter and lots of swings. And even our playgrounds are changing because of risk and legality. And we know that those children aren't getting the sensory um, experiences to their vestibular systems and their equilibrium. And so then they have a harder time attending at school. Um, or paying attention or learning. So it really takes a lot of informed and passionate adults to stand up um, and, and defend the right um, for the young child to play, really for everyone to play, but especially the young child, um, because it's just, it's getting harder and harder for children in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think that is such great advice uh, again, I've lived a lot of what you've been saying, and it is different. And I think being intentional to create those opportunities to play and to promote it, to say it's okay to kind of go and play. So we've talked about a lot of different topics, and I appreciate you so much being on. Um, any clothing, closing thoughts about early intervention or, or play or perhaps promoting some of the places that our viewers could, could find some of the resources? Um, I would just say, you know, I know as a mom, it, parenting is hard. It can be overwhelming. So I say all these things through the lens as a mother. Um, have grace with yourself and your children and just know that less really is more. Um, you know, the holidays just happened and I can't tell you how many families say to me, we bought all these toys and she wants to play with the whisk from the kitchen. And you know, you don't need expensive toys or fancy experiences. Your child needs you. They need the ability to move freely and explore. Um, our communities have so many wonderful places um, that are free to be outdoors, you know, hiking, parks. Um, our community libraries are some of the best places for young children to be, our recreation centers. So don't, I just don't want parents to ever feel like they're not enough or they don't have enough because really you don't need much beyond your time, attention, and love for your child. Yeah, I think that's such great advice. And thank you so much, Nicole, for joining us today sure. and for all of your ongoing work to help people lead healthy lives providing early intervention services and promoting play. And thank you all for tuning in to Live Healthy, Live Well, West Virginia on the Library Television Network.